Josie the Tiger and the Fish is an anime romance film released in December 2020. It's roughly the story of an average college student who was accidentally acquainted with this disabled girl, and how their lives intertwine. Honestly, I was not actually planning to watch this movie. I saw a trailer on YouTube, and it just reminded me of a silent voice, and not in a good way. The cliches, standard plot elements, and emotional manipulation that run rampant in this genre were practically jumping out at me. I sent the trailer to Mikey, we both had a good laugh at it, and that's where the story should have ended. Flash forward to Christmas break, I'm on a 10 hour flight to Hong Kong. Having slept through 8 hours, I decided to spend the remaining 2 watching a film, and while flipping through the movie catalog, there it was. Lo and behold, Josie the Tiger and the Fish. My thinking was that it'd either be good, or it'd be bad but still entertaining to laugh at, similar to I want to eat your pancreas. Little did I know what followed would be 98 minutes of dull, tedious melodrama instead of unlikable and forgettable characters, and a grand message that doesn't end up fitting with the story. Beyond all that, however, is a more important issue. An industry-wide phenomenon I first noticed a long time ago that has recently been getting a bit out of hand. But enough of that. Let's first talk about the film itself, Josie the Tiger and the Fish. As far as the opening credits go, Josie the Tiger and the Fishes is decent. The animation studio, Studio Bones, responsible for such titles as Mob Psycho 100 and Noragami, did an overall decent job in the visuals. In this opening, we're treated to a beautiful scene of a protagonist diving, accompanied by a diverse range of marine life. The following montage helps to introduce our protagonist, Sneo, namely how he's a poor university student working part-time jobs, how he's interested in marine biology, much like some other person. And how his dream is to study abroad in Mexico. His design in general is very, well, boring and forgettable, but that could be said for many anime protagonists. Indeed, the strengths of a character doesn't lie entirely in their visual design. And more importantly, the reason why they're all designed like this is obviously to help them appeal to the general audience. The problem being that I think the writing team somehow adopted that same philosophy when it came to his character. He's such a one dimensional and boring protagonist. The short description I gave of him earlier is just his entire character. No, seriously. By the end of the film, he's also pretty much the same person. Anyway, the following scene is what really sunk whatever good expectations I had left for this movie. While walking home one night, the protagonist suddenly encounters a wheelchair-bound woman rolling down the slope at high speed, and like any sane person, just runs up headfirst to try to catch her. You're being sent this video because someone wants to know what the fuck you were thinking. What the fuck is going through your head? What did you think was gonna happen? Are you just a fucking idiot? The woman eventually flies out of the wheelchair rather comically straight into him. This scene looks straight out of a cheesy romantic comedy and essentially threw any expectations it had for a more grounded, mature film out the window. So the woman ends up on top of him, because of course she does, and then promptly assaults her savior and calls him a pervert. This very woman is our female lead, Josie. This scene was just, quite frankly, fucking terrible beyond comprehension. I actually do not understand what the writers were fucking smoking. Not only is this trope that belongs in some cheap etchy not funny at all, it sets up our female lead to be a fucking cunt. After that incident, not only does our protagonist not distance himself away from this psychopath, he still offers to help her? Considering his actions in the past 5 minutes, is this man an alien? Instead explain that Josie was disabled at birth, and that her grandmother is very protective of her, to the extent that she's rarely let out of the house. So for some reason, the grandmother then offers him a job? Why? She says it's so there's somebody to take care of Josie, but it's obvious that she doesn't really need help? I mean Josie can take care of herself well enough when she's inside the house, and the grandmother doesn't let her outside anyway, so what's the point of hiring the protagonist? As if to prove my point, the protagonist spends most of the time on his new job sitting around jerking off and getting verbally abused by a disabled bitch. This all changes one day when Josie dreams of herself becoming a mermaid and swimming freely in a vast sea of life. The mermaid is a prevalent theme throughout the story, representing Josie's desire to explore the world, free from the physical disability that shackles her. The aforementioned dream then spurs Josie into a random bout of madness? She manages to run away from home. Well, not actually run away. And when our protagonist catches up to her, 
tries to escape by crossing train tracks while there's a train incoming? What the fuck? You're being sent this video because... Seeing this, our protagonist decides to disobey the grandmother's wishes and take her out to sea? Which is also puzzling as he clearly is doing this job only for the money as he says so himself. He hates Josie as she's been nothing but a bitch to him, but still feels enough pity for her just because she's disabled to risk getting fired and take her out to sea. This is equally a problem for the audience, who is expected to feel sympathy for this little brat purely because she's disabled? I surely didn't. If we're up to me, I hope she gets to spend the rest of her miserable life as a fucking quadriplegic. Okay, maybe that's too far. But you do realize there are ways of making a character flawed without just making them outright unlikable? This is pretty important as a big part of getting the audience invested in the story is getting them to care about Josie's struggles. And a big part of that is actually getting us to like her. The fucking writers here are essentially just exploiting her disability in order to score sympathy points from the audience, thinking, oh, no matter how much of a bitch we make her, the audience will just like her because she's disabled. Truly manipulative and disgusting behavior on their part. The story picks up where the protagonist now sneaks Josie out on daily trips while the grandmother naps, and we get a little montage of their adventures. I guess it's interesting to see her reactions to experiencing common things for the first time. Too bad she's still a cunt to him, despite the fact that he's literally risking his job for her sake. He takes her to a bookstore where she makes a friend based on their shared interest in an author, and we have another cringy tsundere scene with the two that isn't the least bit amusing. Earlier it was established that the protagonist was given a scholarship to study at Mexico, conditional on that he must leave by early next year. Now you'd assume, like I did, that this would eventually come into conflict with his and Josie's relationship somehow. Uh, as you'll see, it doesn't. It's also revealed to us that the grandmother knows that he's been taking Josie out, but just doesn't care anymore? The very same grandmother who had Josie confined in her home her entire life, and explicitly barred the protagonist from taking her outside. Even in this very scene, he rejects a job offer for Josie because of this misplaced overprotectiveness. So now this inconsistent character just loses all significance to the story. Another insignificant and annoying aspect of this movie is this cunt a love triangle side plot that goes nowhere. So this cunt works for the protagonist in a diving shop, and from the first scene I knew this would turn out to be a love triangle of sorts. She and Josie do eventually meet, and Josie immediately accuses the protagonist of flirting with her? She then just fucking leaves and has a big fit all over nothing? All that girl did was show him a video and he didn't even reciprocate that warmly. So this nonsensical love triangle culminates in this bitch accosting Josie in front of her home literally a day after her grandmother dies, and begging her to free the protagonist. You do understand that he is his own man, and that as an adult, he's free to make his own choices right. If he chooses Josie over Mexico, then maybe that dream wasn't even that significant to begin with, or maybe he just views Josie as more important. Either way, it's his decision to make. So obviously Josie tells her to start off, because that's what a normal person would do to this crazy bitch. And eventually she confesses to the protagonist, This has no significance to the plot at all. They just kind of move on. He doesn't even bother to reject her. It's almost like he expected her to know that she never had a chance to begin with. So his rejection wasn't even necessary. It's the funniest thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> the girl then has another psychotic episode and visits Josie again banging on her door ranting about her selfish desires and how she never cared about his dreams to begin with. What a terrible person. Well, in the end, her and Josie seem to be on okay terms, 
and their mutual hostility is just played for laughs. She has no interest in the protagonist anymore, and doesn't care that he's obviously very friendly with Josie. Her character is just thrown in the trash where she belongs. So what was even the point of having her in the movie? This love triangle side plot has no consequence to the story, aside from adding some useless melodrama. And that's about how I sum up this character, inconsequential. If you removed her from this movie, nobody would know or care. Matter of fact, if you did this, it'd probably be a better movie. It's really quite insulting how the female characters are written in this movie, almost to the point that the writers come off as misogynistic? Two of them are just major league cunts, both displaying extreme jealousy over a man they aren't even in a relationship with. One of them basically held her granddaughter prisoner in her own home for over 20 years, robbing her of her childhood and experiencing the world. The only other character is Josie's librarian friend, and she barely has any scenes and just serves to be the wise advisor to Josie. But I guess all that's just fine. I also hate women. <laughs> Anyhow, back to the main story. Josie's grandmother just ups and dies, so now Josie doesn't have the money to pay the protagonist anymore. Josie also had a hobby painting and dreamt to be a painter, so now she has to give that up too and works in an office. Yeah, not really sure about this one. Being an artist is a perfectly acceptable line of work, and also plausible for Josie as she has demonstrated some talent. At the very least, she could teach art in the kindergarten or something. As a person who didn't even attend school, how is she more fitted to work in an office, especially since art is her only talent? She could also work a side job while trying to get her art career afloat. She wants to paint, not play in the NBA. Who have thought about what? That a young buck like you could actually do the right thing and avoid getting his sorry buck kicked out the game. Sounds like a wise fella to win in this league. You need all hands on deck. Good call. That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. So regardless, she throws out all her paintings, which is her symbolically giving up on her dream. When the protagonist next visits her, she's obviously depressed and gives a final request to be taken out to the sea again. In contrast to the initial scene, this one has a gray and monotone color grading to indicate Josie's mental state. She tells him that she's given up on painting and he tries to pep talk her, which fails and ends up with her telling him, <laughs> She leaves and on her way back it's raining, causing her wheelchair to get stuck while crossing the road. He obviously rushes out to help her and gets hit by a car. This scene was unintentionally hilarious. There was no reason why they had to show him getting hit like that. It's just funny. This results in an emotional scene, where she crawls out of her wheelchair towards him and calls out his name. It's so bad. He somehow survives, but obviously he's also disabled now. He struggles with recovery and falls into depression when he finds out he'll be replaced by the scholarship if he's unable to travel. So the movie here is obviously trying to hammer home that you never truly understand what a person is suffering through unless you're actually put in their shoes. The protagonist arrogantly told Josie to follow her dreams without truly understanding her world. And in a sense, this is his comeuppance. The problem is, him being disabled doesn't mean he can't follow his dreams anymore. It is more than possible to scuba dive even if you're disabled, especially considering he isn't a paraplegic and it's just that his legs can't support his body weight. His dream of studying in Mexico is also feasible. It's not like being in a wheelchair prevents you from traveling or studying. Feeling responsible about his current predicament, Josie works on a picture book for the protagonist, which she eventually presents to him in the library while reading to children. The story is one about a mermaid and a boy with wings, with the boy eventually losing his wings but still deciding to pursue his dreams anyway, mirroring Josie and the protagonist's story. The protagonist is obviously very moved and begins to work hard on recovery and eventually learning to use crutches, even though there wasn't any reason why he wasn't working hard on recovery to begin with. Prior to this, he makes no effort in his recovery whatsoever, even though it meant him being able to pursue his dream of going to Mexico. The same dream that drove him to work multiple part-time jobs, one which he absolutely hated while still being a full-time student. This was the drive of his entire life up to this point, and he just loses all that in an instant. And in the end, it's a picture book that's able to reinstate his sense of hope? Talk about poor character writing. The end of the movie is Josie having gone missing and the protagonist desperately searching for her. This culminates in her slipping down the same slope as in the beginning, and him catching her again. I can say the second time around, this scene is no less cheesy and cringe, and not at all heartwarming or emotional. 
So apparently the protagonist is also healed from his injuries, as in his search for Josie, he began running. He tells her he wants to be with her, and she obviously asks him about his dream to go to Mexico. He just fucking ignores her, and proclaims his love for her. They kiss, and the end. What a total dog water ending. So in the end, one of the central conflicts of the story is this written off in exchange for some cheesy fake happily ever after ending. Is he taking her to Mexico? What if she doesn't want to go? The movie doesn't give a fuck and just glosses over all that. It's so cheap and lazy. This movie tries to do a lot. It tries to be a heartwarming romance. It tries to have an inspirational message about following one's dreams and the difficulties that one encounters. And it also tries to be a film that intertwines these elements together in a cohesive story. None of it works at all. The romance sucks because none of the characters are likable, and the forced emotions in most of the scenes are just cringe. The message falls flat because the obstacles in them reaching their dreams weren't in the least challenging and were just overcome with minimal effort, and the central conflict of the story was just conveniently resolved without even an explanation. The pacing is also all over the place. The entire second and third act were just characters talking or long, drawn-out lines of exposition intercut with a random montage or shot of scenery. Couple of that with just how uninvested and indifferent you are to the characters and story, it just adds up to be such a painful viewing experience. This is essentially the polar opposite of Rider Wave, in that it's a simple story with simple themes but a horrible and distasteful execution. It was even more of a nonsensical, tedious, and irritating experience than the trailer had let on. When I initially finished the film, I felt so empty and thoughtless about it that that intense feeling eventually led me to ponder on why I was feeling the way I was. And that led to the creation of this video. In the process, however, another thought I had was why this film was made. For those who don't know, Josie the Tiger and the Fish was originally a short story published in 1984, and there was a live-action film adaptation released in 2003. It might be plausible that the film was made for Japanese audiences based on the popularity of the story in the movie. Plus, the director claims that the anime film was made to release on the same Zodiac year that the book was first released. However, I suspect another reason, something much more cynical and depressing. You see, the movie was licensed by Funimation for foreign audiences, but when I tried to find a short story and live action film in preparation for this video, I couldn't find any official copies online. It turns out the live action was never licensed for international audiences, and the English release of the short story was only licensed after the anime, and publishes on March of 2022. So it seems for foreign markets, the movie attracted interest in the story, not vice versa. So what exactly attracted interest in the movie? Well, we have two other movies to thank for that, Your Name and A Silent Voice. Both released in 2016 and to critical acclaim both domestic and abroad, these two films have left their permanent mark on the industry, for better or worse. The popularity of these two films have led many others to try and replicate their success, often without consideration as to what made these films so great to begin with. Correspondingly, I dub this phenomena the Your Name Effect. These films are generally romances with hints of science fiction or fantasy, or otherwise features some form of disability. Tension is also drawn to the use of hyper-realistic imagery. Now, I'm not proclaiming that these films are just trying to copy Your Name or A Silent Voice beat by beat, but that they're clearly made with their success in mind, and sometimes only to capitalize off that success. Prior to 2016, big-budget anime romance films that weren't a continuation of a series were few and far between, usually only helmed by big-time directors like Makoto Shinkai or Mamoru Hosoda. As a matter of fact, the industry in general is very reluctant to invest in original content or any content without a large prior fan base, regardless of their premise. Which is why we only see a precious few originals every year. Josie the Tiger and the Fish, despite already a short story, would have never gotten an anime adaptation pre-2016. As far as I know, the film heavily deviates and expands on the original short story, which indicates that it only served as a general framework for them to work out a new story to fit the movie they wanted to make. The director is also someone with little to no experience working on films. Oh, he directed two seasons of Noragami? Does that mean you can direct a feature length film in a different genre? All of this wouldn't be an issue if the movies were actually good, but they're not. Movies like Josie the Tiger and the Fish, and I Want to Eat Your Pancreas, and so many more that are produced just to buy off the coattails of others all fall flat precisely because of that. Lately, even Makoto Shinkai himself has tried to replicate his own success and failed miserably. I don't think anyone who has seen both Your Name and Weathering With You would say that the latter even comes close to achieving what the former did. It's ironic as looking through his filmography, it's evident that Shinkai himself has experimented with the genre quite a bit before achieving global fame with Your Name. 
could see how his style evolves through each of his films. So it's sad now to see that he's just trying to stick to that formula, essentially trying to create the same movie in different ways, whether it's because he no longer deems it necessary to innovate, or that he's being pressured by the producers behind the scenes. And all of this just gives me more appreciation for filmmakers like Masaki Yuasa do experiment and innovate. I know this is clearly an industry issue and won't be going away anytime soon, but I sincerely hope it'll change for the better. Even aside from this phenomena, every regular season now, the same types of garbage is churned out of this big corporate machine. The same fucking cheap, pandering content, just packaged differently. And every time I see one of those, a tiny piece of my love for anime is lost forever. Animation isn't a genre, it's an art form, and it has so much more potential than what's being done in the industry right now. So anyway, those were my thoughts on Josie the Tiger and the Fish and the Your Name Effect. Feel free to leave a like or a comment telling me I'm wrong or I'm gay and subscribe if you want to see more videos. That's all.